Good afternoon, and welcome back to our symposium, Nation to Nation, Treaties Between the United States and American Indian Nations. I'm Carolyn Repkevian, Assistant Director for Education and Museum Programs at the National Museum of the American Indian. Thank you for being here, and a special welcome to those watching online. We hope you're tweeting hashtags honor the treaties or nation to nation. And before we get started, I want to remind you, please silence your cell phones. I'm honored to introduce esteemed journalists Judy Woodruff and Mark Trehant, who will interview NMAI director Kevin Gover and Suzanne Schoen Harjo, guest curator of the new Nation to Nation exhibition and editor of the companion book. More detailed biographies are in your program and on our website, but let me say a few words about each. Judy Woodruff is the co-anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. A distinguished broadcast journalist, she has covered politics and other news for more than three decades at CNN, NBC, and PBS. She also anchors a monthly program for Bloomberg Television, Conversations with Judy Woodruff. Mark Trehant of the Shoshone Bannock Tribes is the Atward Chair of Journalism at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. He is the author of The Last Great Battle of the Indian Wars, and as an independent print and broadcast journalist, he blogs and posts often on Twitter. Kevin Gover of the Pawnee Nation is the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian and a former law professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Aristona State University. From 1997 to 2001, he was the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs in the U.S. Department of the Interior. His tenure in that position is perhaps best known for his apology to Native peoples for the historical conduct of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And finally, Suzanne Schoen Harjo, Cheyenne and Hokdalgi Muskogee, is president of the Morning Star Institute, a national Indian rights organization founded in 1984. She is a writer, curator, and policy advocate who has developed key federal Indian law, including the most important national policy advances in the modern era for the protection of Native ancestors, arts, cultures, languages, and religious freedoms. Dr. Harjo is also a founder of the National Museum of the American Indian, and please help me welcome them. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, let me start the conversation this way. I'm going to kind of go backwards and um, start at the end. When you walk through the exhibit, and I had a chance just a few minutes ago, to me the extraordinary thing is it's a museum exhibit with artifacts and things looking backwards, but you get a profound sense of the future. Maybe talk about that. Me. Well, I will. Um, that's exactly right. In the spirit of the two-row wampum, uh, that uh, a treaty that the Haudenosaunee peoples made with the Dutch, this relationship that treaties are a part of goes on forever. It goes on in parallel tracts, and it's from the beginning and to the end. Uh, but there is no end. It's a continuum. Um, there are, the treaties stand as markers. In our Cheyenne language, there's no past tense, there's only future and present. So everything either is or is coming. So I think of it in that way too, that the relationship either is or is coming, and we carry everything that's behind us into the future and into our present. Yeah, Mark, that is exactly right. We wanted, uh, we, that, that's a major part of the story is that it is not over, that, that there was no end to, to this story. The end is to be written by uh, those yet to come. Um, I, I think uh, 
what we wanted to leave the, the visitor with is a, is a sense that they now inherit the responsibility for this relationship between the United States and the Native Nations. And for those of us who, who are uh, citizens of, of Native Nations, it's an interesting proposition. As a Pawnee, I want to see the United States honor uh, the agreements that it's made with, with my Indian nation. As an American, I want to see my country honor its relationship with Cheyennes, Haudenosaunee, uh, and all of the other tribes. So uh, the point being that we all inherit responsibility for the conduct of our respective nations. And, uh, and we pose the question to the visitor, how will you um, uh, carry out your part in, in this ongoing relationship? I want to ask both of you, and forgive me if this is something you covered in the morning sessions, but talk for a minute, if you will, about why it was so important to you to do this exhibit. And, and maybe, Kevin, you start. I mean, why was it important? Why, why is it important that the American people understand this? I mean, most people study a little bit about Native American history, and maybe a lot about Native American history in, in school. But then, it, it, for many, I think it disappears from our, from our daily news diet. Um, so why, why was this important, and specifically the treaty? Why look at the treaties? Well, I arrived here seven years ago, and this project was already underway. It had already been conceived. It was already um, um, being worked upon by, by Suzanne and others. Um, the, the, the brief answer is, we felt the United States, we felt uh, uh, the people uh, needed a civics lesson and a reminder uh, that the Constitution doesn't just refer to the federal government and the state governments, it also refers to the Indian tribes. And so Indian tribes uh, in our history have become a rather unique element of American federalism that most people have no appreciation of. Um, even if you go to school, even if you study hard, even if you read everything that's assigned, you will not learn that. And, uh, and so we want to place that concept into the center of our understanding of, of American federalism. Native nations have been making treaties for millennia. And even in 2007, made a Pacific Rim Treaty with Native nations of the United States, of Canada, and uh, peoples in Australia and the Maori in New Zealand. That's um, an ongoing treaty that was made uh, just recently, uh, very recently, 2007. We started this exhibit in 2003, and we were, Vine Deloria and myself, and the prior director, uh, Rick West, had given us the green light to start, but he said, you have to start very slowly because, of course, he was finishing some of the things that Vine Deloria and myself as trustees of the museum uh, just ended our uh, tenure, had tasked him with and the, t and the staff with opening and uh, three museums, building two from scratch. And this one that we're sitting in now hadn't opened. It was not to open until September 21, 2004. So in 2003, Vine Deloria, and I asked him to be the um, uh, co-curator, and he said, I don't know anything about exhibits. And I said, you don't have to. And he said, and all I know about art is I like John Elway posters. <laughs> There's got to be a connection somewhere. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I said, but as the leading treaty expert uh, in the country, uh, we uh, certainly, you know, there, there are your credentials. And he said, oh, great, okay, yeah, I'll do it. So we select, we decided that go slow meant that, that we would select uh, advisors who included great people, John Mohawk and, and, and Billy Frank and Hank Adams and Oren Lyons and other people who really made, um, uh, made us smarter and, and taller and have more ideas. And what we did was to group treaties together. And we all agreed that it had to be treaties. It had that 
because they're foundational and they're so emblematic and they're so little known that the, most of the non-native people think of Indian treaties as Indian treaties. They don't think of them as their treaties. And these are, as Kevin said, everyone's treaties. These are the United States and the native nations. And we all have rights and we all have responsibilities. The United States gained a territory over which to govern through treaties. If you don't know treaty, and I'm not talking about treaty law, but if you don't know treaties, you don't know why the United States is shaped the way it is, why the states are shaped the way they are. You, you just don't know American history. So this is our gift to our own people, many of whom do not know this, this history or may know everything about their own peoples and their own treaties, but not know about others uh, in different re regions. So this may, may, may be uh, something that, that we're gifting to the native people too, but primarily we're gifting this to the non-native people who will be the greater number of visitors here. Right. Kind of picking up on that theme, if this is a civics lesson, how do you get the idea out there in a broader sense that this is the American story? Well, in part, of course, <clears throat> we get uh, a million and a half visitors a year. And uh, this, this exhibition will be up for four years or so. Uh, so a great many people will see it uh, with their own eyes. Um, but there will also be uh, uh, access to this, this material online. And most importantly, the museum's working on an education initiative where we take this material, shape it for classroom use, and, uh, and make it available to teachers and, and train educators on, on how to use this material. And hopefully those educators will train other educators and we can slowly but surely um, put this into classrooms throughout the country so that it, it's not limited just to the visitors we have here. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> How do you how do you uh, 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 how do you educate someone uh, or you know children adults when as you say many come into this with a blank slate almost it, 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 I mean you're you're reminding us that that the, the history of the treaties is the history of this country the United States of America how do you tell that story you know where do you insert it? I mean, how did you think of, the, it fits where into U.S. history? How did you think about, you know, the way you constructed it? You know, you can, you can take this story and insert it in any, any number of places. If, uh, if uh, students are studying the Constitution, for example, um, they may be reading some provision of the Constitution and say, I didn't, what, Indian tribes? What, what's that about? And that's where we can intervene and say, this is what that's about. And the treaties are, are, are derived directly from the Constitution, the authority to make treaties, the reasons for making treaties, the, the nature of the Indian nations as, uh, as people that you make treaties with. Uh, and so, and there will be many opportunities. Uh, and and, and the, because the key point is that, as Suzanne was saying, the treaty story isn't just an Indian story, it's an American story. And we will be looking for opportunities throughout the curriculum whatever subject uh, a teacher may be addressing, um, we have the opportunity to say, uh, here is some material that relates directly to that element of the curriculum, and it involves Indians. And if we do it well, um, it will also say, and it involves African Americans, and it involves uh, Latino Americans and, and, and really begin to construct a more inclusive version of history so that students understand how one thing leads to another and the decisions that are made at every point and that each of these stories is their story as well, whoever mm -hmm. they may be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The treaty story, of course, begins before there was a United States and is so important to the beginnings of the United States, but it's an international history because it was nation to nation amongst the native nations and because it was native, uh, nation to nation amongst the native nations and the European nations. 
So the two-row wampum uh, that we show upstairs is, is Haudenosaunee, Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy with the Dutch. Uh, we also uh, reference heavily the Lenape Treaty with William Penn Colony, which was with England, uh, not just a little tiny colony of, of Quakers that they represented England. So we're talking about countries, and then the United States comes along, and that's um, uh, with one of the treaties, there had to be a secret provision because it was ending. Uh, that was the, the Treaty of New York between the Muscogee Nations and the United States in 1790. The, there was a provision that had to be secret, giving time to the Muscogee delegates to get home and alert the people that they were ending a trade treaty, a trade gr agreement with Spain. Right. In order to come into a treaty with the United States. And why? Because someone had to control the lawless people who were moving in and, and messing up the neighborhoods of the, of the Muscogee peoples <laughs> in the, what's now the southeastern United States. And it couldn't be uh, Georgia because they wanted to ethnically cleanse the, what they saw as their land uh, of, the, of the Indian people. They wanted to get rid of the Indian people. So it had mm. to be the United States coming in and exercising control over its citizens and its visitors. You've both uh, talked about the Constitution. Earlier this week was Constitution Day, not one of the greater holidays in the <laughs> scheme of things. Um, yet on communities that have signed treaties with the United States, Treaty Day is a big deal. And one thing I'm curious about is a sense of solemnness that continues and it's passed down uh, pretty much across the country. I wouldn't say solemnness. It, it, certainly it is a solemn uh, occasion, but it's also a, a reverence. These, these treaties are, uh, are iconic and they represent an acknowledgement by the United States of the nationhood of, uh, of, the, of the Indian nations that, that they dealt with. Uh, you will see upstairs that we, we, uh, we deal reverentially with the Treaty of Canandaigua um, because it is, it is an important document. And so you'll see it encased and lit in much the same way that the, uh, that the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are, uh, are encased and lit uh, at the National Archives. Uh, and we, we want the visitor to come away with a sense of just how, how important this is. Plus, it is so cool. Because if you, look at, uh, if you look at the Treaty of Canandaigua, you will see the marks uh, specifically of people like Corn Planter and Handsome Lake, who are well known to, uh, to Indian people. And then along with that, you'll see the signature of George Washington. So to ponder for a moment that those people had their hands on this thing that has been so carefully preserved in the National Archives for over 200 years, um, and then we get to have it in our museum for a few months so that other people can see it. Uh, really, I mean, that's, that's what makes uh, museums really cool. The Navajo, the Diné people um, have Treaty Day for the Navajo Treaty uh, with the United States of 1868. And they call that treaty um, the old paper. And Jennifer Dennett Dale, uh, who will be here if she's not here right now, um, Dr. Dennett Dale, whose ancestors were at Bosque Redondo, where they were confined, the Navajos, after the long walk there. Um, and they were scheduled to go to Indian Territory to be removed totally. Uh, they, it, Jennifer talks about how when the people saw at another uh, exhibit in uh, Arizona with a borrowed original from the National Archives, when they saw old paper when, in their language, that's the translation, they wept. And why? Because that's, it was there. It's the evidence of, 
of their ancestors. It's the witness to their ancestors. It's part of their history that you can actually look at and know that some of their ancestors touched. And in the case of the Navajo Treaty, what a miracle. I mean, they, they here they are after confinement in a, in a concentration camp at Bosque Redondo. They are um, uh, and ready to be removed uh, forcibly to Indian Territory. They negotiated a treaty that secured their homeland back home within the, the four sacred mountains. That was so important to them. That was their goal in the treaty, and that's what they got. Now, they still had to walk home, <laughs> the other part of the long walk. So there's good and bad and everything, but the treaty secured home for them. They didn't have to go to Indian territory where they did not want to go, and they were no longer prisoners of war without there ever having been a war. They could go home and walk, run, skip, jump, they went home. And I'm sure the walk back was faster than the walk there. You know, the, the exhibit, the, the story of these treaties covers hundreds of years in, in time. Um, and I want to ask, I mean, I think many Americans, and perhaps all Americans, feel a sense of shame about what happened uh, over a period, that long period of time. Uh, and the way Native Americans' uh, futures were determined. Um, how did you approach that sense of unfairness, mistreatment? How, how do you go into something like this and not just be overwhelmed with the feeling that it was just so many wrongs were done over such a long period of time? It would be very easy to construct an entire museum around those wrongs and say, this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, um, and, and, and show all of that um, in actually graphic detail. But then, then people are just left with that, with an emptiness, with a sense of shame, with uh, um, a sense of loss. And the, that's not the purpose of this museum. What we want people to see is that Yes, these, these, these things happened, and they were terrible, and, uh, and, and we, need to, we need to reflect on that. But look, look at us now. Look at what the Native nations are doing. Look how they've not only survived, but they've managed to prosper in, in many circumstances. And above all, to say, this is who we are. We're not going to change. Uh, and, um, and we insist, we demand. That, uh, that you accept that and honor the commitments that have been made in the past. And so the end of this exhibition, I told the, the, the folks early on, said, I, let's start on the high ground and say, isn't this, isn't this fascinating how this history began? And then show, bring them down and show what happens when those ideals, that two-row ideal that Suzanne talks about, are abandoned. Tragedy on a massive scale. But then, because of the nature of Indian people, the nature of the human spirit, bring them back up and watch how, how the tribes uh, have insisted through, through persistence, through um, deep, careful thinking, uh, through strategy, using every tool at their disposal. They've managed to, in many respects, restore this to a, a respectable relationship and given us the opportunity to go forward uh, as uh, in, a, in a good way, um, as good friends and as, uh, as partners in, the, in, a, in a relationship where both the Indian nations and the United States can prosper. So we never want to leave a visitor with a sense of helplessness or shame. We want to show them this is still going on and you have a role in it and what you do and what you say about these things matters. And we don't have to detail all of the wrongs. You just have to, it, the world knows what the world knows about the treatment of Native peoples. And the United States has been on a trajectory of progress from wrong to do something in the modern era to provide some measure of justice. 
no matter how small, no matter how inappropriate it may be for the, the overall thing. Nothing will ever provide justice, but you know a good effort when you see it. And when you have a law that, that provides for the return of our relatives and our sacred objects from museums, from repositories where they've been wrongly held, uh, that's an effort. That's a good faith effort when you have a law that, that provides for the, this museum. That's a good faith effort. And it doesn't flinch. That particular law doesn't flinch from the past. It talks about the excesses of the civilization regulations that criminalized everything that was native. Talks about the, the uh, beheadings that were done by the Army Surgeon General's Indian Crania study. All of these things are suggestions of what happened. And you don't have to know every detail. And what we have is that kind of suggestion. We go into some detail under bad acts, bad paper in the exhibit, where you, you look at the past and say, what were they thinking? And how horrible. But it doesn't leave you there. It leaves you with what we're going into the future with. My mother, who could not talk about the Sand Creek Massacre without crying. I called one day before giving testimony about Sand Creek, because I wanted to make sure of certain oral history uh, nuances. And she said, now remember, don't get too angry, don't get too sad. Because at the same time that these things were happening, our people were also over here before and after the Sand Creek Massacre, telling stories, telling jokes, camping with each other, fishing and hunting and picking berries together. We, we knew each other. We loved each other. So remember that you're talking about all of life, and all of our life and all of our history is not one massacre. One of those stories that comes through in the exhibit is the powerful image of Billy Frank Jr. and the return of, uh, I mean, now thousands of people in Seattle will be around like Washington watching salmon return, and that's only because of what happened with treaties. Um, maybe talk about that part of the exhibit and redemption. Mm -hmm. Billy Frank Jr. is a friend to many of us here and uh, a mentor to many of us here. Um, uh, an uncle to my son who's, who's here. Uh, and he was a very great man who's been honored as a treasure by Washington State and who's been revered by governors and, and presidents. And he describes most of his young adult life, as well as his teenage years, as he said, I was the go to jail guy. Because he would go out and, in accordance with the Medicine Lodge Creek, Medicine Lodge, Med, Medicine Creek Treaty, he would fish on his Nisqually River in accordance with that treaty, and he would get busted, and he would be sent to prison. He would be beaten up along the way, and his gear would be confiscated, and all of these things. It was all of that. It took all of that, not just on the part of Billy, but on the part of many people to force this into the courts, and finally to get a hero judge like George Bolt, federal district judge, who said the treaties are the treaties, and a Supreme Court that said, yes, the treaties are the treaties, and they're nation to nation, and you have to look at them as the Indians of the time understood them, and they were looking at them, too, as the Indians of today understand them. What did Billy Frank think? Well, he thought he had a right to fish. Anyway, it takes a lot of work to maintain these treaties. So welcome to the struggle, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, I think you were pointing out, as a result of the tribes uh, becoming a part of the, of the management of the resource, slowly but surely, um, there seems to be a, a 
the resources rebounding and, and becoming greater. So they're having the largest run in how many years uh, of salmon uh, this fall. Um, and that is in no small part because Indian nations are now part of the regulation of the resource. And that was part of Billy's vision too. And, and an extraordinary part because it would have been simple enough for him to say, you know, I'm gonna take as much as I, as much as I can uh, because I have this right. But it was the resource that mattered to him and the, uh, the, the, that the resource live on and be cared for because after all, the salmon is sacred. Uh, to these folks, and, and they, it was their understanding of the ways of the salmon, uh, I believe, that's led to the rebound of the resource. Talk, if you will, both of you, about some of the individuals who made the most difference in, in uh, these treaties uh, coming, to be, coming uh, into being uh, on, on both sides. Who, who who stands out? Who are some of the, your favorites or your least favorites? Um, I know you've spent a lot of time with us, so. Mm. Suzanne? Well, being Cheyenne and Muskogee, I, I love the, the, the Cheyenne uh, part of, along with the other Plains, Native Nations, and the United States, because everyone was making treaties with each other for boundaries and for the, to cover the entire plains. The Cheyennes and Lakotas and Arikaras and, and Mandans and Hadatsas and lots and lots of Native Nations were making treaties with each other about where exactly our boundaries were going to be and, and with the understanding that if your sacred place is here, you go there. I mean, you, so it's freedom to roam, freedom to, to go beyond your boundaries. And then making a treaty with the United States about the, um, the tiny trail that they wanted, no wider than a Conestoga wagon, which must have sounded so modest, like an ant trail across the plains and that would eventually become the railroad, uh, no wider than the Conestoga wagon. So this was a, a major treaty that um, had so many people in the treaty camp, uh, over 15,000, and so many of them being uh, burning sage and cedar and other medicines uh, for a good treaty, for a good encounter, for good ongoing relationships, uh, and, and of course smoking in the pipe for those who did, um, that they call that treaty the, the Great Smoke because it, it, would just cl it was a cloud on the plains of, of smoke. Of, of sacred smoke, and we're not talking about you know smoking pall malls or something. <laughs> this was um, this was mostly done without without breathing it in. It was uh, uh, sacred medicine. No so, e-cigarettes. That's right. So, so the peoples were. Uh, so this was the great smoke, and the people. You know, we know who they are. We know we have pictures of them. We know who from uh, 1851, and here they're represented. Uh, when, when I went into the collection here and really looked at the pipe bags, uh, what I was looking at was pipe bags and pipes from 1851 that were at Fort Laramie right there. So these were traded. These also were witnesses and evidence. So when you see in the book or in the exhibit pipe bags and pipes, almost all of them are from that exact time, from that exact place, from the Great Smoke. They were part of the Great Smoke. And that's very exciting to me. The other very, I'll say this very quickly, uh, about Muskogee Treaty of 1790 with George Washington, they knew each other. I mean, the Muskogee delegates went to George Washington's home. First of all, they're greeted at the tip of Manhattan when they arrive with their canoes. Uh, by 300 white men 
dressed as Indians, cheering. What, what a shock. <laughs> they must, <laughs> must have thought, what? <laughs> what a shock. <laughs> what is this? So they, they were greeted by the men of Tammany Hall, which had been named for Chief Tamanen, who made, was the Lenape <laughs> chief who made the treaty with William Penn for the colony land. And so the Tammany uh, Society people were, formed a parade and took the delegates into Congress, which is pretty amazing. And New York was the capital of the United States at the time. And they had a big dinner and galas and all of that with the Tammany Society people. But privately, they had dinner with, with George Washington at his home. And John Trumbull was there, and he had just finished painting the iconic painting of, of George Washington in his military outfit. And George Washington wanted to play a joke on, on the Muskogee delegates, so he had Trumbull set up the painting and then Washington opened a door, and here he was standing next to himself. <laughs> so, now, and then Trumbull, then the people felt it, and they didn't like it because it was cold. And so Trumbull said, can, we, can I paint you? And they said, no. He writes about this. Can I paint you? And he, they said, no. So they, um, uh, they, he, he painted them. I mean, he drew them surreptitiously, and those drawings are, are here. And they're beautiful drawings. They're the closest things we have to a photograph in 1790. And what I like about that particular thing that Trumbull writes about is you never think of, of George Washington as having a sense of humor. <laughs> that's, right? that's for sure. <laughs> and even as corny a sense of humor as that is, <laughs> it's still a sweet, charming sense of humor. And he was trying to communicate across, I mean, he didn't speak Muskogee. And one of them, the head of delegation, did speak English. And some of the others did. But they were talking mostly in Muskogee. He was speaking in English. They had a translator. But this was his way of communicating directly with them and saying, look at me and look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that's pretty wonderful. They loved it. The Muskogee delegates loved it so much that they made a ceremony for it and changed the name wow. of, a, of a tribal town, a daughter town, to Hickory Ground. Uh, there are two that had the same name, and they changed it to Nyaka. Now, you may think that that's a beautiful Muskogee word, but no. It, it is now a Muskogee word because it's our tribal town, but it's the sound that they heard when they heard New York. New York. New York. <laughs> <laughs> so it's New York a tribal town. New York, which, New York. <laughs> <laughs> which is in Oklahoma. You can see it. There's a New York -a mall, a country store. <laughs> I just, I think of George Washington as the first selfie. You know, he was <laughs> That's his wonderful. own picture, his own painting. <laughs> That's great. All right, Kevin, you have to weigh in, too, on your, some of your favorite Well, I think my favorite story, or the, famous, the favorite sort of image I have in my head is, uh, is from the, the story of the Navajo Treaty. The Navajos were um, prisoners of war, as, as Suzanne pointed out, with no war. They were simply prisoners. And, um, and they were scheduled to be sent to Indian Territory and no less than General Sherman was there to, uh, to see that, that that was carried out. And his responsibility was to make a treaty with the, with the Navajo people where, whereby they agreed to, uh, to move to Indian Territory. And I, I just have this vision in my head. Sherman was well known uh, not to be a very patient fellow. And, uh, uh, and I could just imagine him losing his mind as the Navajos are negotiating with him, uh, Barbancito and Manuelito and all the other leadership, and just uh, in their own way, just saying, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and, uh, and him cajoling and threatening and raving and raging. And they're just going, mm, no, we're, we're still not going to do it, <laughs> right? That's right? And so, uh, uh, so that, that's, that's, that's sort of my favorite 
fantasy about, uh, about how all this went. Uh, this remains an international conversation this morning. I was uh, tweeting during the uh, sessions, and I was seeing posts coming back from Scotland. Um, how does this still be a world story? Oh, my. Oh. Well, we'll know tomorrow morning, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> the, the Scots came over very early and interacted with the Muscogee peoples, and the British had tried to kill them all, and they had symbolically killed every one of their clan leaders in order to destroy the Scots clans. But the Scots, so that was England, and what had happened to them there. But their clan system was the same as the Muscogee clan system, and they, some of them went into Muscogee societies without even skipping a generation, and maintained their own clan and took another clan. So, it, that's, an, that's something that, so in some of the earliest um, uh, lithographs that have been done, the earliest depictions of Muscogee people, you'll see some of them with a tartan. And say, so wonder what that's about. They must have really liked that design or something. But no, that's from their family, from maybe a father or a grandfather or um, someone who, who had, that's their actual clan, so they carried that through as well. So the Muscogee people have long interaction with the Scots uh, as, um, as people who wanted to be separate from England at that time. And I don't know what's happened since. So we'll see. Well, as you know, Mark, I'm a lawyer by training. And, and one <laughs> of the things that, that I've noticed uh, that, that really kind of fascinates me is um, not only have the, have the tribe successfully um, uh, begun the process of restoring uh, a negotiated bilateral relationship with the United States, but they've also entered the international framework with the uh, uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And in fact, there, there's meetings going on uh, this coming weekend and, and through next week uh, concerning that and concerning basically the status of Indigenous people worldwide. So, uh, and, and so, uh, and, and the one thing that, uh, that, that the Native nations uh, in the United States have that I suppose only the, uh, the Maori have among all the indigenous people of the world are treaties that acknowledge their sovereignty. And, uh, and, and that's, um, that, that puts them in a special position um, worldwide. As, as having this unique relationship with, with one of the major powers in the world. Picking up on, on what, Kevin, what you said about uh, the, the reaction to General Sherman, no, no, and no. <laughs> I'd like to hear from the two of you a little bit about negotiating skills and negotiating approach and how that evolved over time. The, uh, the leadership of the tribes were profoundly skilled negotiators. And uh, I, I rather think of it, they, they didn't show up with a commission necessarily to speak on behalf of all their people and to sit down and drive a hard bargain and make a deal. Uh, they were always very aware that they had to also, they weren't just negotiating with the Americans, they were negotiating among themselves and with their own people and having to develop consensus. And so these things weren't a matter of, uh, of uh, coming to a meeting for a few hours or even a couple of days, but rather a very long process uh, before the two sides even met of discussing internally what, what is it we need, what do we want uh, uh, from this outcome. And then a treaty council might take weeks um, and so every day they would meet, discuss, uh, at the Great Smoke, it went on for, for weeks. Um, and, and there was ritual associated with, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, every meeting. Uh, and, uh, and so they were extraordinarily patient, they were extraordinarily principled, and they were very strategic. Um, you know, we, 
we uh, make the mistake these days, many people, of thinking that the treaties were all very one-sided and that the Indians basically got conned. They sold Manhattan for $24 and that sort of nonsense. Um, when in fact, at every step, the native negotiators were entirely aware of their circumstances, uh, the strength or weakness of their position, what their objectives were. And because they were uh, such good negotiators, there are still native nations to this day. Uh, had they not been, um, there's no reason to believe Indian people would still be here. Kevin and I descend from two people who were heads of delegation of the Southern Plains nations, chiefs who met with President Lincoln in 1863 here in Washington, D.C. Um, my mother's great-grandfather's brother was Lean Bear, Starving Bear, who was the head of the Cheyenne delegation and one of the co-heads of the uh, Plains Nations and Ten Bears was um, Kevin's ancestor on his Comanche side. And they went into the meeting uh, with separate goals, they, all of them. Uh, President Lincoln wanted the Southern Plains Nations to remain neutral in the Civil War. And the Plains Nations wanted one thing, no more encroachment by American citizens. And we want a new treaty with new land away from the gold rushers into Pikes Peak and everywhere where the gold rushers were rushing. And all the settlers were flowing. So actually, they all wanted to go to Indian Territory uh, as opposed to other people being dragged there. So the Southern Plains nations uh, remained neutral. They entered into an unwritten treaty, but it's in our oral, oral history. And the evidence of that is that the Southern Plains nations remained neutral in the Civil War. So that possibly had an out, uh, something to do with the outcome of the Civil War. And for even though my ancestor and the other two Cheyenne chiefs uh, were murdered by the Colorado Volunteers, uh, my ancestor in Kansas, and then a few months later, the other two in, at Sand Creek. Um, and shortly thereafter, the president was murdered by someone of his own people who didn't like the way he had negotiated the Civil War. Even though they were all gone, the treaty promise was carried out by the United States and by the Cheyenne peoples and by the Comanche peoples and the Arapahoes and the Caddo's and all the other peoples who were there, the Kiowas, uh, at that time and who entered into that treaty in a, in a series of, of treaties all called Medicine Lodge Creek Treaty uh, with you know, the United States, with the Cheyenne Arapahoes, the United States, and so forth, with, with all of them. And I, I think it's no accident that uh, Kevin and myself worked together at uh, Freed Frank Harris Schreiber Campbellman uh, when it had a, a big Indian law practice and that we were negotiating all sorts of agreements and treaties and, and things on behalf of clients there and that we worked together when I was running the National Congress of American Indians and that we're working together now uh, that, that Kevin is uh, running the, the National Museum of the American Indian that we both helped to bring to life and, and negotiated. Um, for my part, we, I was part of the trustees that were negotiating square footage for the National Museum of the American Indian, all the facilities the, for the permanent collection at, in New York at the Custom House, and, and then for the CRC and, and the, the, the Cultural Resources Center and the, the um, museum on the mall that we're sitting in. 
we negotiated literally square footage, and we negotiated how many floors down. And, uh, and Smithsonian, you still owe us two floors for the National <laughs> Museum of the American <laughs> 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 And you're patient and you're gonna get We're it. We're very patient and it's not your fault because they hit water after three stories and we had negotiated five down, but I just wanted to put that in. <laughs> because one of the messages in the exhibition is we never give up. <laughs> and Suzanne well, this is, uh... absolutely embodies that, that notion. This is just the beginning of a much larger conversation, and uh, I knew this time was going to go awful fast. So please join me in thanking Suzanne and Kevin and Judy. We'll be back shortly with another panel. Thank you all.